The saga of jailed mobster Martin Tessetta gets an investigation from New Jersey state authorities and a big boost from the former boss of a local crime family. Also, a big search up in upstate New York on the a, a farm linked to the Gambino crime family and a guilty plea coming in Philadelphia in the big half billion dollar fraud scheme involving par funding. A lot to unpack this week and the best guy to unpack it with right there, George Anastasia. Professor, welcome again to the show. Appreciate you coming on. No, thank you, Dave. Good to be here. Let's uh, start with uh, a little update on Martin Tassetta. He's a captain with the Lucchese crime family, been in prison for 30 years, uh, beat a murder conviction, but got convicted on RICO and some other charges. He's been in court uh, down in Tom's River, New Jersey, trying to get uh, his case overturned, either a new trial or set free after almost 30 years in prison. We've been chronicling that for the last uh, two or three months, making a big deal about it. Now, George, there's some new news, and it starts with the state thinking his allegations about tampering with witness uh, with, with evidence and hiding evidence deserves a closer look like a state investigation. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's legitimate that it should be investigated. I think the problem is, where have they been for the last three years? I mean, this this is an issue that's been out there. And at the very last minute, as they're waiting to have a, a hearing, they say, oh, wait a minute, we got to look into this. They could have been looking into this for two years, and they haven't been, which is indicative of what the defense has been arguing throughout this case, is that the government's been playing fast and loose with the rules. And uh, this is just one more example. And and. and in a lot of ways, of the leg tactic. I think the problem, Dave, we've talked about this. Is yeah, I, the government's not sure where it wants to go with this thing. It, it it can open a can of worms that is is not beneficial to them at all. And the simplest approach might be to just fold their tent. I don't think they've reached that point yet, but uh, I think they're getting there. Yeah, the allegations by uh, the Tassetta camp is that dental records, which would have proven that Martin Tassetta was an hour and a half away at his dentist's office, were tampered with, A, that the state sent those records to an FBI lab to be looked at. There was a report that indicated they were, in fact, tampered with, sent back to the state, and none of those items were turned over to the defense during his trial, and now they're asking for either a new trial or set me free kind of thing. Uh, I think he's got a real shot at, at at least a new trial. Yeah. I and mean, I think what gets lost in the woods here is, and you mentioned this at the top, he did not get convicted of that murder. The jury found, found there wasn't enough evidence to convict him of that murder. And that dental records would have supplied him with an alibi indicating he couldn't have committed the murder because he was at the dentist. Uh, that's one part of it. But the part, the point that the defense is making is the state used two key witnesses, uh, Little Odd, the Arco, and Phil Leonetti to establish that Tassetta was, in fact, a murderer, claiming he had said he did the murder. And right. that kind of evidence would have undermined their testimony about everything. Because if they said this, if they're lying about this, what else are they? So, you know, it's one of those things where you got to get into the, to the weeds to figure out just what the issue is here. On the other hand, and, and we've talked about this before as well, I have a couple guys tell me when this went down, everybody knew that, Tassetta was not one of the murderers in this case. But one guy said, but the, but the point was, at least in organized crime circles, he believed Tassetta was bragging about the fact that he was involved. So you got to, I think you have a situation here that Diarco and Leonetti could have been telling what they thought was the truth, even though it wasn't factually accurate. Mm -hmm. if, if Leonetti says that Tassetta told me he killed Craparata, and we got another guy saying, yeah, Tessetta used to brag about that, even though he wasn't one of the guys. Then you've got a situation where, ah, eh. but the fundamental issue is the government had these records and did not turn them over. And you can't, that's, you, you got to play by the rules. And that yeah. ha didn't happen here. And that's what, and that's what's going to be interesting if they get the prosecutor and other individuals up on the witness stand. How did this go down? Why did you look for those records? And then when you got them analyzed, by the FBI, why didn't you turn him over to the defense? Yeah, and props to Marco so LaRocca, uh, Martin to set his and lawyer. And, and uh, for 30 years, yeah. Yeah, Martin, uh, I mean, uh, 
Marco LaRocca, Martin Tassetta's lawyer, has been really holding the state's feet to the fire on this. He was all ready to go with a hearing back in March. Yeah. They pop up and say, oh, you know, now we're going to conduct an internal investigation to see if somebody actually withheld those records or tampered with those records and why this report wasn't turned over. LaRocca went back at them. Not only do I want to know that, but what about Bobby Carroll? He was the prosecutor on this case. He's the Morris County prosecutor now. He was the state prosecutor back then. I actually worked with him in the attorney general's office and he led the defense. He led the prosecution on this case. They want to know from him what happened to these records, what happened to the report on these records, and they want to put them on the stand. There's going to be a point of disagreement on this. I believe the judge is going to probably compel Bobby Carroll to go on the stand. And one of the things you and I talked about last time, does the state really want Bobby Carroll to get on the stand or do they want to fold the tent? I think that could be a dividing line or a, yeah. line of embarkation here if you want to say that yeah i mean i think it's going to be some difficult questions for for carol to answer and and it goes to the i mean the real heart of this appeal has always been the defense is claiming the government had a vendetta against these guys because they beat that big federal case in newark a, a few years earlier and that this wasn't really about justice it was about revenge for what happened before it's unfortunate um but there may be some truth to that. And, 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 you know, as we've said before, this is, this is not a perfect system and there's a lot mm -hmm. of human traits involved in all of this. And you've got a lot of law enforcement people, I think back then that were frustrated and angry at as a tour of the Tassetis, that whole New Jersey Lucchese crew. And this was their way to say, you know, how, you know, you, you beat us over there, you got away with it, but you're not going to get away with it again. The question is, you take that approach to you start bending the rules and the state's not supposed to bend the rules. Yeah. Interesting. Georgia uh, change. Just so we know on uh, dates and stuff like that, that hearing now, this evidentiary hearing on this whole matter is now set for May 1st by the judge in Tom's river. There is an April 17th uh, conference call with all the lawyers to get an update on the state investigation and the Bobby Carroll issue to see what's going on there. So we could get maybe an early move by the state if they decide we've seen some things in our investigation we don't like. Uh, we're not sure what we're going to do with Bobby Carroll, so maybe we'll reconsider. Uh, or we get our hearing on May 1st. Either way, within the next month, we're going to get at least some headline out of that Tom's River courtroom about this case. Yeah, and, and as we said, I, 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 can't, I can't in my mind imagine the state pushing this issue when they've already gotten 30 years out of this guy. He's done 30 years. And if there's even the hint that, that there's some kind of nefarious operation that was going on behind the scenes, the state won't want that to come out. Yeah. George, um, Martin Tassetta has a new champion out there on social media. None Not, other than the man you've labeled the podfather, podfather. Joey Merlino, right. the former reputed boss of the Philadelphia crime family, because that's what he likes to be called now. So we're going to call him that. Uh, seen here back in the day coming out of the roundhouse. That's Martin Tassetta, obviously, on, on the right there. George, um, Joey's gone on two big podcasts, Vlad TV, and in this past week, Camp Gagnon's podcast, talking about Martin Tassetta and what a crime it is that Martin Tassetta is still in prison. Why don't they let this guy out? Your thoughts? Well, I mean, this, this case is right in Joey's wheelhouse. Since Joey started this podcast, one of his Consistent rants has been the government lies, the government, the witnesses lie, and innocent innocent people are in jail. In this particular case, uh, there's a lot to back him up, and and it fits into the the theme that he's been preaching since he started back in what September with yes. this podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I I think there's there are there are plenty of reasons to raise questions about what's happened to Martin Tassetta, and. It, it coincides with the campaign, if you will, that Joey's been on since he started this podcast. You know, yeah. the good guys, the good guys are all in jail. But, you know, it, it's not that simple. But in this particular case, I think he might be right. Yeah. Uh, his line on both his own podcasts and these outside independent podcasts, which, by the way, Vlad TV has about four million followers. Yeah. Sure. Camp Gagnon's about 215,000. Those are big time podcasts. I'm sure that's why he went on there to promote his own podcast. But his thing is, look what the government can do to you. Look what they did to Martin Tassetta. He's been uh, making that claim this one this past week. Twice he brought it up. 
once near the top of the show. And then he went into detail about the dental records. The, doc, the dentist's, dentist's office was an hour away from where the murder took place. He seemed to know the case uh, and some of the details, George. Is he paying attention to us? Is he paying attention <laughs> to the court documents? Or is somebody from the Lucchese crime family maybe whispering in his ear saying, hey, what about Martin Tassetta? You could use him as an example. I, I would think it's all of the above. And, yes. you know, and I mean, Joey has been in the past close to some of those guys up on that Lucchese organization. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't surprise me if they mentioned that to him. And as I said, this fits into his wheelhouse. It's just what he's talking about. And it's unfortunate. I mean, we're getting to, to a place in this country that is not just with the mob guys. You know, we've got another prominent individual who claims every prosecution is a witch hunt. Yes. And it, it's, it undermines the whole judicial system. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to sound like a preacher who waved the American flag, but Joey's had a lot of cases where he's benefited from the ju judicial system. Yeah. You know, he's, he beat a big murder case in Newark. He beat all the murder charges in the Rico case in Philadelphia. Uh, he got he his beat case. a case in Camden as well. Right. And he got the case up in New York down to a, a pleading to a minor gambling offense. You know, the, the system is not perfect. But if you look at, by and large, everything that's happened to Joey Molino over the course of his career, um, the system has not done him uh, has not done him badly, I would say, given all the circumstances, all the charges uh, and all the cases that were piled up against him. Now, you want to go on a rant about I'm um, persecuted. Everything I do, I get prosecuted for. That's a whole nother story. And as I said, we got a guy running for president that's playing that same note. So we'll yeah. see. And listen, in mob circles, um, this is a good maneuver to talk about this. In fact, oh, sure. I, th I think most people, if you take a look at the facts here, think this Martin Tessetta case deserves a very close look. Yeah. And if these things that the defense claims and that Marco LaRocca claims, his lawyer claims, if they're true, uh, he deserves another shot, in the least another trial, or look at the total picture that you talked about. He's been in jail almost 30 years. He has three left to serve on this sentence. Let the guy out. He's 73 years old. What happened to justice reform there? This is basically, uh, it doesn't have a murder in it at this point. That violence part of it is gone. It's a RICO case. Exactly. 30 years isn't enough on a RICO case? I don't know. I mean, again, this, I think, underscores the argument the fence has made all along. This was a vendetta case. Mm. This was not so much about the charges as it was about getting even with these guys for past activities and for the big case up in, in Newark. Uh, there may be some truth to that, unfortunately, and that's that's just the way. You know, it, it, again, you got human nature here. You got individuals. Uh, you got guys in law enforcement that spend a lifetime chasing after these guys, and there's sometimes there's frustration and anger that come out when they. Yeah. I mean, there are guys if you know, and I know, Dave. There are guys in Philadelphia right now, law enforcement guys. You start talking about that particular crew, the Merlino crew, and they will say they got away with murder. Now. The, the flip side of that is they were tried and found not guilty. So did yes. they or didn't they? But yeah. that's the attitude in law enforcement. And so they're they're apt to uh, go on somewhat of a crusade. And I think that's what happened with this Lucchese group. There was a crusade among law enforcement. We're going to finally get these guys. And I think they bent the rules to get them. Yeah. Okay. Um, some more big news breaking middle of the week this week. Uh, another search at two About farms. It. In upstate New York, in Goshen, New York, right near Goshen, New York, by the FBI, the NYPD, the medical examiner's office, uh, New York State Police, uh, two properties. There's some pictures right there um, from some of the local newscasts up there. Uh, they searched them in November after 10 members of the Gambino crime family got indicted in New York. Two days later, they were up there looking. Supposedly, they came up with nothing. Tuesday of this week or Monday of this week, they're back up there searching again with tents, with some equipment up there, with search dogs. The medical examiner is along uh, and they're up there searching, George. What does that tell you? They didn't find anything the first time. They seem to be more specific about where they're looking this time. Yeah, I mean, I think as this case is playing out, I think they're getting more information from informants or cooperators. The very well may be a cooperator in this case. And uh, the fact that the medical, medical examiner is along for the ride gives you a clear indication of what they're looking for. They're looking for bodies. Mm -hmm. This is a case involving the carding industry, the trash business in New York. And it's got connections into Sicily as well. So you got this 
Gambino crime family, which has always had Sicilian ties. And now you've got this. What you, what you go from here is a, a racketeering extortion case, potentially into a murder case if they can find some bodies. I think they know what they're looking for. Somebody has told them what to look for there. Question is, are they going to find them? Yeah. And the background on these two locations, according to information that's been out there and some by uh, federal authorities, is that these two locations have some kind of connection to the Gambino crime family, that members of the Gambino crime family for years have gone up to these two farms, go up and they go target shooting, turkey hunting, probably deer hunting up there, those kind of things. Kind of a getaway lodge for the wise guys in New York, especially in the Gambino crime family. Um, most of the people who live up there locally say the only shooting they do is, you know, at at wildlife, stuff like that. Um, but the reports are that there possibly could be more than one, multiple bodies buried up there, that kind of thing. And that's why it's drawing the attention of the FBI. But this has been a longstanding uh, place to go for the Gambinos 50 miles outside the city. Right, exactly. And, and you know, I, I would think some people are probably being told, telling law enforcement this is not only a getaway, but it's a, a burial ground. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's consistent with what we know about the history of organized crime. That kind of stuff was going on all the way back into the 1920s and 1930s. I, again, it comes down to, you know, how long and how many places have they dug for Jimmy Hoffa's body? Never found it. So <laughs> we don't know where this yeah. is going to go. But yeah. to me, going back a second time, right on the heels of the first visit, bringing all that equipment and bringing the medical, medical examiner indicates that they, they know what they're looking for. Yeah. We'll see. We actually had a dig involved of our own in the Philadelphia crime family when Dutchie Avicoli disappeared. Michael Avicoli disappeared years ago. They never found him. The rumors were that he was right. brought up to North Jersey, murdered by someone up there, put in a barrel and put in the ground. FBI's dug up there multiple times uh, looking for that. And to this date, nobody's been found. Exactly. That's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, th- this kind of thing is not new in terms of organized crime and, and burial grounds. The question for the government is, can they can they find a body? Where, you know, where are the bodies buried? That's what it comes down. Yeah. To. Yeah. And if they do find the bodies, I think that the dynamics of that particular racketeering case expand exponentially. And then you get then you got some real serious problems with some of these guys. Uh, and, and you may see more guys cooperating as a result. Yeah. How nervous do you think the Gambino crime family guys are up in New York right now with a second search going on like that as we speak? Well, I mean, it's a question of if, if there's anything up, they know what's up there. If there's nothing up there or if they're looking in the wrong place, they're going to, you know, Ronnie Previty always used to say that, you know what you did. Yeah. The question is, does the government know what you did? And <laughs> you, know, you can't kid yourself. So yeah, depending on where they're searching, what they're, you know, these guys, if there are bodies buried up there, the guys that buried the bodies know where they are. And if the government's looking in the right spot, then they're going to be nervous. If the government's yeah. looking five acres away, then they're not going to give it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some other big news broke in the last week or so. Um, we've been chronicling and following the big half billion dollar par funding fraud scheme, which is now a racketeering case in New Jersey. Uh, which stars as key defendants Joseph Laforte and his brother James Laforte, who, by the way, was indicted in that New York indictment we just talked about, along with 10 other members and associates of the Gambino crime family. He's allegedly a soldier with the Gambinos, inducted into the family, I think, in 2019. Um, Joe Laforte's wife, Lisa McElhon, uh, 43 years old, was charged in a separate indictment. That's her right there with her husband for right. tax evasion conspiracy and failing to pay $1.6 million in Pennsylvania state taxes by claiming they were living in Florida when they actually were living in Pennsylvania. And the feds indicted her and her husband on that. There is a sealed plea agreement. We haven't seen it, so we don't know really what the details are, but the rumors out there in the court system in New Jersey in federal court, I mean, in Philadelphia in federal court is that there might be a change of plea I think it's April 16th or 17th, George. Your thoughts? Right. Yeah. No, I mean, this, uh, not surprising. I mean, this is a strong case. And and then you got, you got a husband and wife situation. If this is a case where she can get out from underneath a lot of what's going to come and plead guilty to a charge, and, you know, she's got no background 
history, mm -hmm. no criminal record, or anything like that. She may be able to walk away from this, not unscathed, but not as in dangerous, harmful a position as her husband and some others in that case. And maybe that's what this is about. Yeah. Um, it, it, there's no indication uh, of cooperation from, from that end. I mean, I think there are some cooperators out there. And this is a very, we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. It's a paper case, but it's a strong case. I mean, there's so much doc documentation yeah. and so many bizarre actions on the part of the Laforte brothers that um, I'm not surprised that defendants are starting to plead out. Yeah. And and this has getting taken very seriously by the feds because there were threats made on witnesses. Yeah. Uh, an actual witness, a lawyer in the case was beaten yeah. allegedly by the brothers or one, at least one of the brothers. Um, other people claims that they're going to burn houses down, set your car on fire. I'm going to harm somebody. They went to a prominent realty individual who whose real estate assessment of their property they didn't like yeah. allegedly and threatened harm there uh all kinds of things like that this is has serious uh allegations of violence or potential violence here and and that's why these guys are looking at a solid rico case as you said george very well documented by the federal yeah. government yeah and we've mentioned this before if this isn't a mob act if it, if it isn't a mob if it's not a mob case Mm. The actions that are depicted here are certainly mob-like. Yeah. I think someone's going to pay a price because of that. Yeah. Uh, Joe Laforte is quoted as saying, I got 500 guys on the street behind me. There's a tape where someone mentions the cement shoes and a yeah. trip to the riverside kind of thing. Those are all things you see in mob movies and stuff like that. Uh, kind of giving it a new life here in, in Philadelphia. That case, by the way, may get tried this year it may not joe laforte is also facing weapons charges when the fbi searched his house up on the main line they found i think 14 weapons in the house including some high-powered weapons um he has to face uh charges and a trial on that beforehand or at least that's the schedule right now and then this case um you think that gets tried in uh, 2024 george I, well, I mean, the weapons case, it's another example of how do you defend against that? He's got prior convictions. He's not supposed to have weapons and he's got 14 weapons. How do you explain that away? Uh, you know, yeah. so you you know, that looks to me like a slam dunk for the government. Yeah, um, I don't think you get the bigger case. I mean, it's it's so layered and so many documents. I would be very surprised if we see that case in court in 2024. But but the weapons case is pretty much straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. George, you covered the first plus white collar crime case in New Jersey. How long did that trial take? And that was a voluminous amount of evidence and witnesses in that case. My, Three my, or four my, months, my, was it longer? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it was eight weeks, nine weeks, something like that. There were right. multiple defendants, uh, a lot of tapes, a lot of, uh, so many documents. It was staggering. So, and a lot of witnesses. So I think this case would be similar to that. And if First Plus took six to eight weeks, this has got to be, a, it's certainly in that time frame, maybe even more. Yeah. And George, you know what the sentences were in that Nikki Scarfo Jr. and uh, Sal Palullo. Give doing us 30. what they got. Each, each are doing 30. I mean, they're, you know, and they're, given their, their prior convictions, uh, you know, they're not going to cut much of a break in terms of reduced sentence. And, and they're going to have to do most of that time. That's just, yeah. that's the name of the game here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, 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 we still are waiting to see whether this part funding ends up with a mob component. And we, we said this before, if there is a mob component, I think it's in New York, not in Philadelphia. Yeah. So far, the only mention of such is that James Laforte allegedly passed one point five million dollars to one of his co-defendants in that New York case. He's known as Joe Brooklyn. He's a capo who's got some other problems down in South Jersey involving a restaurant owner and his wife that were allegedly threatened and uh, with all kinds of things, including violence. Uh, supposedly one point five million dollars went up there possibly got whacked up and kicked up to others in the Gambino crime family. We haven't seen the, uh, all the evidence in that yet. So we'll wait and see where that goes. But so far that's been the only real mention of it aside from the fact that James Laforte is allegedly a soldier in the Gambino right. crime family. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a case, it's a fascinating case. that's worth watching. And the fact that we've got a guilty plea and, and, and other rumblings, we'll see where it goes, but it, it it is going to be difficult, I think, to defend against that case, given all the evidence that's there. Okay. George, uh, I want to end this week uh, talking about somebody that you and I knew very well, uh, a friend to us over the years um, in his official capacity, 
played it by the book all the time right. in his retirement. has been on this podcast a couple of times. I'm talking about James Marr, Jim Marr, who was the special agent in charge of squad one, the mob squad here in Philadelphia for a long time, uh, actually was in charge of the squad when they put Joey Merlino away on racketeering charges, George Borghese, a number of other guys. He passed away uh, within the last month and we wanted to give him his due here. Uh, from my perspective, a great guy, did it by the book, revered in law enforcement. Just your, your thoughts on Jim Moore. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And he, he was, he had this historical memory. I mean, if, from Bruno right through the Merlino years, this was a guy who was involved with all of the cooperators, all of the investigations, and could put, you know, put the pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, so too often, I think we lose sight of that. You're just, you're dropping into an investigation. You got to have historical perspective. And Jim Moore had that. And uh, a, a very decent man on top of everything else, a decent man. Yeah. I used to, um, his big thing when he retired was to work at the USS New Jersey on the right. waterfront in Camden. Yeah. Yeah. Volunteered there. And that was his passion. Yeah. You know, I'd run into him in the store in Cherry Hill when I lived in Cherry Hill for a little bit. He and his wife and and he would talk about doing work on the USS New Jersey. And then we'd joke about different cases that we covered. And he, he'd throw a few shots because he liked yeah. to take a few shots at the media. Oh, yeah. I'd throw a few back. Uh, friendly banter. Super nice guy, always respectful, and uh, his funeral and the wake were very, very well attended uh, right, by right. members of the, of the FBI. And, I, and I'm told people stayed for hours to talk to the family and talk about Jim Moore amongst themselves kind of thing. That tells you what kind of guy the guy was. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there were dozens and dozens of Jim Moore stories. Anybody got involved in that that particular world at that particular time. Yeah. And I got to tell you, we had him on uh, – the podcast, George, you were on too with uh, right. Barry Gross talking about the Stanford case yes. uh, on the 25th anniversary of the conviction where yeah. Stanford went to jail for five life terms. All his minions also went to jail. I think 28 or 30 people yeah. went to prison uh, based on that case. And uh, that was one of our more fun podcasts to have yeah. Barry Gross and Jim Moore and they're telling backstories on trying that case. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and he'll be missed. I mean, he, he was retired. He wasn't involved anymore, but, uh, it was always someone you could go to with a question and yep. sometimes he would answer. Sometimes he wouldn't. Sometimes but, he couldn't and he didn't, you know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, listen, rest in peace, Jim Marr. Yeah, we absolutely. greatly appreciated your friendship uh, and we respect you highly and to his family, our condolences and our prayers. And we wish you all, all the best. Absolutely. George, another great episode. Thanks for participating. I always like that. We unpacked a lot of baggage here today. Uh, and there's four more different to come, cases on all the things we talked about today. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and listen, it's uh, they're all worth talking about. Uh, so I appreciate your time and appreciate you coming on the show. Anytime. Thank you, Dave. All right, folks, that's it for Philly Prime Podcast and Mob Talk Sit Down this week. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll be back next time. Keep listening.